So what are some examples of walls? How do we build walls around ourselves? And it's not fancy. What's one of the biggest walls? Go ahead. Uh, the phrase, like, if you have your guard up? Yeah, if you have your guard up, then you probably are walled off. What are some other walls? Not sharing feelings. Yeah, not, not sharing anything, right? Not talking about it. And basically, that's what happens here. Nothing gets out, and nothing gets in, and that's like, OK. I finally have a little of my own space. But then you're not sharing stuff. Work can be a wall. That's one of my favorites to use. Oh, I'm busy, and I'm working. And everybody loves that you're working. Oh, yeah, you're working? Oh, good. You know, <laughs> People ask you, right, like, how are you? Oh, I'm busy. Busy, 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 busy. Ooh, you're busy. <laughs> I didn't ask you what your activity level is. I asked you how you were. And that's more about your feelings. Now, it's OK. You know, in American culture, we say, how are you? And we don't really mean it. But, and that's, that's OK, actually. Right? This is how we move through our culture. But the thing is, is sometimes people actually ask. And we just kind of say, I'm busy or, you know, oh, whatever. I'm actually asking people or I don't ask. I, I don't do that anymore. I'm not like, how are you? And then I don't mean it. I don't ask people how they are unless I want to know. So is that confusing a behavior, like using a behavior to not talk about your feelings? Like, I am this behavior? <clears throat> yeah, that's often one of the walls that's used. So I'm busy, other things like that. What about the data device you're all carrying around that could take you to the moon? So it's not an inherently bad thing, right? This is not a bad thing. It's an amazing thing. And it has wonderful things about it. But what is everyone doing whenever they're online somewhere? Pretending to be on their phone. Sometimes they're actually on the phone. Other times you're just pretending. OK, I don't want to talk to you. So oh, oh, hello. You know, I mean, like, whatever it is. We've all done it. And we do it all the time. So the problem with this data device and that we carry it around is that basically it provides this perfect wall all the time. So you, you go out to eat, and everyone's on their phone. I'm going to get up and leave the table. I don't want to have dinner with those people. I can just go eat alone. It's the same thing. What are other walls? They're not fancy. What do some of you use as walls? Sometimes I'll insult others to push them away before they project me. Very nice. Yeah, exactly. So if I, and it's cool that you even know, oh, I think I'm afraid of being rejected. And so then the teen will kind of go ahead and throw something out there. Good. In my own family, I see uh, my younger brother, he's having struggles in his relationship and he plays video games like 40 hours a week. Yes. And actually, that's moving into gaming addiction, just so you know. And I'm sure you guessed it. If it's 40 hours a week, that's a problem. Even if you're independently wealthy, you know, because I do have clients like that. You know, and basically it's like, well, I don't have anything else to do. I'm like, yeah, you do. <laughs> why don't we start a business? Or why don't we go do volunteering? Or, you know, I assign lots of things to people, and they don't always like it, but they usually do it. <laughs> Sarcasm. Sarcasm, yes, absolutely. That's a great way to push people away and not really talk about what you're really feeling or experiencing, which usually is some anger. Sarcasm is veiled anger. It's socially acceptable anger. And it passes for comedy. I personally read. Yes, that's a great one that I don't always remember. Yeah, always reading, always having little earbuds in. You know, those are all walls. And it's not that it's wrong, OK? It's just that it's not very functional. And maybe sometimes you need to use a wall. I'm not telling you that you have to be this perfect little vessel or being. I'm not. That's not possible. Remember, it doesn't exist. Sometimes I'm like, no, right? But I know that it's my teen when I'm doing that. And I'm aware, and I can decide. And I think that's one of the biggest differences. Do you think people who like exercise an inordinate amount, like two hours a day? Yes. Well, some people wouldn't say that's inordinate, but it is, that is a wall. I'm always exercising. I'm always working. I'm always doing this. I'm always doing that. I don't want to interact. You know? And where I live, there's a lot of exercise kind of addiction. And in this town, actually, it's really interesting. It's like heavy drinking and then go running a marathon. <laughs> I'm like, are you trying to have a heart attack? Because that's what's going to happen to you. you know? 
So it's this extreme stuff. Yeah, exercise can be a wall. Um, especially with girlfriends, uh, when, when they were trying to be intimate, uh, just talking, um, and they wanted to talk about feelings or how I was feeling, I would kind of just go silent for a little bit. Yeah. And I've been, I've been telling myself that it's, you know, I'm having a feeling and I just want to process it so that I don't like insult them or something like that. Um, well, that's also kind of making up their reality. Like, you have to take the chance, and then if you insult them, they have offended themselves, and you're the catalyst. So that's kind of like doing two sides, trying to do two sides of the relationship, which is exhausting. I'm sure you guys can all relate. Jen. Can it be as subtle as small talk that doesn't go deep enough? If it's chronic and consistent. Yeah. yeah. Let's just talk about our day versus how we really feel. Exactly. And sometimes we don't know exactly how we feel. And so that's why you, you learn that feeling stuff. So that maybe you could take, you would know what it is that you're thinking and feeling, and then you could share that. But that's risky, right? And that's why you have to be able to protect and contain yourself, which is, remember, that's the adult state. And so that looks like this. You're a little dot, but you build this nice, permeable, strong, system, this boundary system around yourself. So you can start to slow down your reactions to what other people's reality that you're creating for yourself. So they do or say something and, and you start to have a big feeling about it. When you have boundaries, you can slow it down. So basically, it has to go in a little bit for you to have your thought and feeling about it. But then you get to decide what to do with it. And maybe you're like, that doesn't match at all. Well, guess what? Then you pitch it. You don't have to accept everyone else's truth and reality as your own. That's absurd. It's absurd. Your job is to know what yours is and then share whether it matches or not. Does my reality match yours? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Like I can say to you, like I see you're wearing a t-shirt. And one person hears, he loves my shirt, I'm cool. Another person hears, oh my god, I can't believe it. he hates my t-shirt. All I've said is you're wearing a t-shirt. You see what I mean? Like, it's just nutty how people just kind of assume that what, what the other person is thinking or feeling, making up that reality, their, their reality, and then responding to it in real time. You don't even know. You need to ask. We'll get to that in a minute, OK? For closed off, pretty much prevent anything from interacting with your reality. So using any excuse, distraction, nothing, yes. so that your reality is, you're the only one who interacts with your own reality. Yeah, pretty much. You're like, that's the ultimate protection because it, it's going to move to an extreme. There's no way to kind of like, you know, do both. Yeah, because you're, you're worried about it. Being, you're worried about what it actually is that your reality is constructed by, almost. Well, what it is is that you're actually all kinds of exposed. And so the only other option before you're learning about this stuff is to wall yourself off. So it's just a response. Your teen's just responding to what your child needs. And boundaries are not modeled for most of us in our family, in our parental relationships. Most parents, you know, and it's not necessarily terrible, but it's not very functional, make it about them. I don't like what you're doing, so you better stop doing it. How dare you do that? Shame on you, right? No, 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 no. It's not shame on you. It's this is not the best way to do it. It's not about my reaction to it. It's about, hey, this doesn't really fit with kind of how society works, and my job is to help you to learn how to do that. You don't have to explain all that. But it's not always about us, especially when it comes to your kids. I have two questions on the, on the accepting the, the other person's reality thing. So the first is you talked about, it's about slowing, slowing it down so you this have help you an opportunity that. to, so how do you, because it, it We're feels to me it. sometimes. Oh, well. I'm going to teach you exactly how to do it. I promise. The other part was something I was thinking about yesterday is like, um, you, met, you were talking about sort of social media and stuff like that um, and how we, we've created this kind of echo chambers and, and people don't communicate. So, and then we punish. One, one of my, like a, a concern might be is like, well, 
if I'm if if someone says something that I might disagree with, and I'm just going, well, that doesn't match my reality. Then it's easy to create this kind of thing where it's like everybody has to agree with me. Otherwise, it's like no, that doesn't. Yes, that would be your team taking over. So understand, like that that could happen. Like where it's like, but I'm not saying, oh, I learned from this guy that I don't have to listen to your bullshit. <laughs> that's, a, that's a teen place. That's a better thing. That's a better than, right? Not a better thing. It's not a better thing. It's a better than. So basically, like, that's, a, that's when you're in a teen place. You're being better than and closing up. And that's why you learn these ego states, right? It's not just a framework. It's supposed to also be a, a tool to kind of know what's happening within you. So I'm not encouraging you to continue to use walls like that. But you have to be able to slow it down a little bit, and you're going to ask yourself some questions that I'll get to at the end. But you're going to ask yourself some stuff, and then you're going to be able to know. Because um, you want to be able to decide. Like, does it match or does it not? And see, if you don't have any boundaries at all, you have no idea what you actually think and feel. You just take on what the other person thinks or feels. And that's a problem, right? Because then we're not actually honoring ourselves. We're not actually sharing who we are. And isn't that what relationships are supposed to be? I'm not just talking about primary relationships like intimate relationships. I'm saying just being relational. You're a human. The, the goal is to relate. You know, loneliness, right, or that kind of pain around lonely, you know, that's called the human condition. I didn't think that up. That's been said. Who knows who said that? And it's the truth. So as soon as that umbilical cord is cut, you are on your own. Period. That's how it works. And so basically, we have this desire to connect with other people. But we get damaged in that process, and we don't know how to really do it. And what boundaries afford you is not a wall, but a way to actually connect. And that's important. People are surprised when they come to work with me in my little town of Redondo Beach, which is actually pretty small, um, that a lot of people know me. And they're like, how come everyone's saying hi to you? I'm like, because I say hi to them. <laughs> and I'm a creature of habit. I really am. I love my routines. And so basically, I go to the same places and see the same people. And it really throws people off. It's fascinating that it throws them off. But they're like, everybody knows you, and you're like really nice and people want to talk to you and I'm like I'm not trying to be nice I'm just seeing people and so when you have boundaries you can see them because it's not as threatening to you to see them because whatever they're gonna do or say doesn't have to impact me that's about them and I get to decide what to do with it so it makes you strong it makes you brave it makes you be able to go how are you and really mean it and you don't know what the hell they're gonna say they might yell at you or scream at you. Well, if you have a boundary system, you can handle it. They might talk too much about themselves. How are you? Well, this terrible thing happened, and then this happened, and now this happened, and you're like, <laughs> right? But if you have boundaries, no, 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 it, it happens. You know, People are too close. If you have boundaries, you're like, you know what? I'm not able to talk with you about that right now. I can't do that. I have to go. But I'll talk to you later. See ya. You're able to actually just be real. And people love it. They're like, you on that last thing? You just did? Yes. That's what's so weird. If you're in an adult, <laughs> it's super weird. If you're in an adult place and you're really just communicating to people, it's like moths to a flame. So I guess the difference is when I'm, if I send that to somebody who's coming from a team place, like that's that right. Place, right? I don't want to hear you. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So if I'm doing it, it's all about the intent, right? Yes, it's about your internal barometer, and, and you can think of that as intent. But it's like, I'm not being better than when I, I don't have time to listen to your shit. I'm important. I have things to do. I have someone flying in this morning or whatever, right? There's a child under that. It's like, oh shit, this person's never going to let me go. Right. Yeah, they're, and exactly. Very good. And so basically it's, you know, it's like, oh gosh, now I have to listen to their crap, you know, and what am I going to do with it? The child's like, that can be scary. And so you learn to kind of build a big wall. And the thing about New York and also, you know, if we're growing up there as well, is that there's so many people everywhere in your space all the time. 
And that's why most New Yorkers are very teen oriented and build a lot of walls. Because you have to, to deal with like 80 million people <laughs> trying to walk in one direction. One of the things I have to say though about New York is that people cooperate with each other in unspoken ways. And that's something I miss. That's when I, when I was talking about like how I like to, I think, I think sometimes about moving back, is because it, where I live, no one's cooperating with anybody. It's I'm in my bubble and you're in your bubble, but my bubble's more important than your bubble. It's true, LA is interesting in that way. It's kind of a lonely city as well. What do you mean they cooperate? It's like you have to to kind of like, for example, walking down the street, you have to know what's around you or you're going to get run over or you're going to cause a problem. And so everyone kind of is aware of what's happening around them and moves through, at least in Manhattan, and also Brooklyn's become very dense. Everyone kind of moves together. There's like this unspoken, we got to work this out. We don't have that in LA. It's like, get out of my way. My Range Rover's bigger than you. Move. <laughs> It's, it's, it's just a totally different culture. It's even the New York archetype where like, some disaster happens, the entire city rallies together. Of course, because there is this, you're in it together. Yeah. It's just really different, yeah. But it doesn't look that way unless you live there for like seven years. You need to live there for at least, no really, seven or eight years, and then you start to understand it. Same with LA, you need to be there for seven years. You start to kind of understand it after three, you think you understand it, and then you live there longer and you go, oh, I kind of get what this is all about. They don't really mean, they're not really asking me how I am. <laughs> they're not really gonna call me. <laughs> it's one of the first lessons people learn when they move to LA. Because it's the social contract is how we function in Los Angeles. So, and that's misconstrued where people are like, oh, everyone's using each other to, to, to get something else. Who can you connect me to? is very much in the culture there. This is not a whole sociology lesson that we're going to get back to boundaries. But it's, it's just a very different way of moving to the world. But if you understand it, it can be refreshing because people are nice. I don't care that it's fake. I like it. People are nice. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you're being nice. That's great. I'm not going to take it too seriously, right? Because I have boundaries. Sometimes they're being nice and they mean it, but it's pretty rare. Especially if you're kind of a powerful person or people know you, they're going to try to well, what can I get from this? But I don't think that's wrong or bad. That may sound really weird to you, but I get to decide what to do with it, just like everybody else. So anyway, those are two extremes of American culture, and I just happen to have grown up in both. Yes? I wanted to ask about um, forgetfulness as a um, wall. It can be a wall. Like, oh, I don't remember. And then sometimes maybe you really don't remember. So if that's practice enough, you stop remembering things. <laughs> Like it literally feeds upon itself. You know, I'll have clients that start and they're like, well, I don't remember anything. And I'm worried about it. I'm getting all this testing. And I'm like assessing them, because you know I'm assessing all the time. And I'm like assessing them and I'm like, no, you don't have a memory problem. You just have a bunch of walls and that's the one that you choose. So that's a really interesting one you bring up because that's a very sophisticated wall and people don't always notice that that's what's going on. Well, the other, I guess, option is that you have these other walls, and then because of them, you don't really attend in the first place. Yeah, that's true, too. I mean, it's kind of a feedback loop. It's like you're not even noticing what's going on around you. It, it, that's, that's a very walled-off type of person. That would be an extreme use of walls. So the, the thing that's frustrating to me looking at this is I think, yeah, sure, strangers, no problem, boundaries, I can do it. Personal relationships, especially with my wife, like how do you how do you do good boundaries when the other person doesn't have them, when the other person it's, takes things personally, when the other person does their child and teen and whatever else, and it affects you because you live there and because you have Right. And and there's no framework for it, you know. So basically it's like pushing a boulder up a hill is what it is. It's hard. But I want you to know that this is not designed for strangers. This is designed for the people closest to you. It's the same thing, and how we use it, which I'm going to get into, is the same thing. But it's designed for actual, like, I'm really relating to you. But you know, there's a lot of bad habits that exist in a long-term relationship. And so when you have a whole history of not having any boundaries, which is what you're describing, which that's on your side too. It's both. So then you learn how to do it, and the other person's like, what in the hell are you doing? 
this is not how this works. I have a feeling and you're supposed to fix it. Or I want to, I, I, wait a minute, this isn't about you. It's about me or us, right? So it's, like, it's hard. It's like pushing a boulder up a hill. But you also learn how to share your reality with that person whenever you're not triggered. Like, well, when I hear you say that, what I think is I have to take care of you all the time. Or I'm supposed to fix this feeling for you. And I'm angry at you about it. You start actually saying what you're not saying. And then the relationship, there's friction, sometimes to the point of almost breaking. But if people really are wanting to be around each other, then usually they start to work it out. One of the gifts of pain is growth. When you have boundaries, other people do not like it. So I'm not going to act like it's going to be easy, Leanne. It is not. But I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. That's my reality. You have to decide if it's worth it to you. And I believe that you are worth enough, just as you're worthy as everybody else, to take the risk and learn how to use it. And sometimes your partner will surprise you. But not at first. Don't expect a miracle. They're usually pissed. Because you're doing not what they want you to do, but you're doing what is right for you. Who the hell likes that? That's not human nature. I love it when people do what I want them to do. <laughs> Getting it's great. <laughs> but that's not always appropriate. And, and if we're sacrificing ourselves, then we are actively building low self-worth. And over the years, that gets compounded. And then we have, we're just like a little, a little nub of a thing, basically. And we thought we were doing the right thing the whole time, but we were not. It's kind of what I was talking to you about earlier. It's the same thing. And I personally am, I am worthy, and I want to remain worthy. Because that's the truth. We're all worthy. You know? You're worthy of doing it. But it's not going to be easy. But you have some tools. Yeah, so question, I guess. Well, I'm, and uh, this is intriguing, but because I build walls for a living, literally with my construction company. But um, <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really in tune with this. Um, but uh, I'm only kidding. But I guess what, what's coming up for me, the big question is, is introverted versus extroverted? If you are somebody who's more introverted, how does that, because I guess what I'm wondering is it might be a little bit of a finer line because you do want more alone time or you do, like how does that play into all well, of Taking time or being a little less, like a little bit more introverted doesn't necessarily mean you're using a wall. It's anytime you're using a wall to being intimate, that's what this is about. Because see, you have to have boundaries to actually be intimate. What I'm saying is you have to have a separation between yourselves and between people to actually then share what it is that you think and feel. So when people don't have boundaries, they're not actually being intimate with each other. They're just enmeshed. Right? It's like, I don't know where I begin and you end. So there's, there's, they're not like, they don't compete against each other, introverted, extroverted when it comes to being able to set limits or, or kind of, sometimes we just need some space. Like I, I'm like a little bit of a balance between introvert and extrovert. And so I'm very extroverted in my work. I am actually kind of introverted though. Like I like to be alone. And to be honest with you, I almost enjoy my own company more than other people's some of the time. It's the truth, you're not supposed to say it, but it's true. And so like, you know, I go home and I like to just be me there with the dog. You know, I mean, it's just the truth. And so I don't want to deal with anyone or whatever. I'm not using a wall, though. Like, if somebody texts me or calls me, I'm usually going, to be like, hey, what's going on? Right? I'm not hiding. It's just I need some alone time. I mean, you can imagine, you guys kind of see, and like, I expend a lot of energy and hold a lot of people at one time. And so I need to be alone sometimes. I think it's also how other people perceive things. Also, sometimes, since I'm probably more introvert than extrovert, I think also it's how other people perceive that you may have a wall that may not be real. 
So right, right. Like, think, like I got when social welfare out of college, um, I was actually really shy and um, insecure. Um, but because like I got an MIT, like people viewed that as arrogance and aloofness. And so I think it was more about other people thought I was putting the hole, and per- especially because they were not in ex- they were extroverts, not introverts. Um, and I've dealt with this my whole life because I also have a very serious look and face. And so other people perceive wall when it's actually not there. So it's actually it's actually not my wall necessarily, and I've had to figure out how to manage that sort of stuff, right? But like. It's not a wall, it's a perception of a wall from someone else. Right, so their reality is you have a wall, and your reality is that's not the case. And then you being able to communicate that would be like the platinum standard of it. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like it's, it, I mean, I do, when I do talks now, I actually put a picture of my family and like a smiley face. <laughs> no, I understand. I just put this up there both as a, as a reminder to me and to you all, because once I get going, I'm going to get intense really quickly. And so I need you to know that I'm a human being and I have a family and a life, and that's not why. But like I literally am proactive about like that's how bad it's gotten for me in the sense of like I'm not called bad, but like I have to be so preemptive because of the assumption. And so. and you having better boundaries will enable you to allow the assumption. I'm not telling you don't do what you're doing. Yeah, so it doesn't. So I figured out that it doesn't serve me like to have that, and I need to like I need to bridge. Right, so we all think, I mean, like, like three hours, I go, like, what they call resting bitch face for women, like, I have the same thing, whatever the guys is. Well, I have the same thing. Trust me, I understand. Right? I'm not all warm and fuzzy, necessarily, and some part of me isn't all warm and fuzzy sometimes. But the good fact, your socks are great, by the way. <laughs> so all I'm, so I'm not telling you not to do what you're doing, Bob Eck. What I'm saying is, like, it may bother you a little bit less, in having a little bit better boundaries, where you don't have to rely on it as much to make yourself feel safe when you're giving talks. Oh, it's more about like I just I need to invite I need to uh, allow other people to realize they can actually I'm approach, more approachable than they No, I know. But it's like but that thing about boundary is more about I think it's just more about the perception from outside in than it is it's, than it actually about reality. No, I understand. But what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know. If, when you have really good boundaries, you allow people to do whatever they're going to do. This is a little bit different because you're giving talks and, and this works for you. I'm not telling you not to use it. Right. I'm just saying like, you know, it's like they're going to think, they're going to think because of experience, right? It's not based on nothing. But it's like everyone here is going to think that I'm like a bitch. So I need to do this thing to make sure they think something different. And what I'm telling you with better boundaries, that's not as important to you. It doesn't drive it as much. It's like, let them think whatever they want to think. And then I get to decide if that's my reality. And that's, the, that's a little bit of difference. So I'm just saying, not don't throw away what you're doing, but you could add in a piece where you're not as worried about what other people think. Because the reality is, is when I met you, I did not think that about you. So see, you're assuming that everyone does. Yeah, so I'm totally aware of context. So in certain environments, but like yeah, in certain environments, like when I'm up front, like it's different, right? So I have, like yeah. I have to like literally sound fake, but like I actually have to remind myself to smile. No, I understand. So, yeah, but that's more of a pragmatic business thing. It's not coming from a place of insecurity, like oh my god, I'm afraid. No, of exactly. That's why. It's- no, 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 no. That's not true. That's no. not true. It is pragmatic, but there is insecurity within it. You're worried about what they're gonna think about you. Uh, so I, I'm, I could, so I'm fine with what you're saying. Ultimately, it's actually not worry. It's I'd rather engage with people, and it actually doesn't serve me when people think I'm intimidating. So you're not worried that they think you're intimidating? Um, what you're telling? No, it's a pragmatic. So that, that part is actually pragmatic. <laughs> are, you, are you worried that they think you're intimidating or not? It's, that's not the question I'm asking. This no, way. I'm asking you a question about that. But I'm saying that my intent isn't coming from there. So yeah, there's worry, okay. but it's about an intent because I would rather have a relationship than be by myself. So I get it. so yeah, but it's worry, but it's self-serving ultimately because I'd rather people feel more comfortable coming being, approaching me right. than not. So yes, there's worry, you. but it's about pragmatic and life. Yeah, well, it's a way to deal with the worry. And I'm saying add in a piece where you're not as worried. So if there's a better boundary there, you won't be as worried. You may still do it, but you'd be more comfortable.
it's possible. I'm actually, yeah, that's fine. I, I'm, I actually am comfortable. Like, I think we all have to figure out like, what our strengths and weaknesses are and navigate them. And that's, this is my means of navigating. It's not a buy now. Yeah. I know. But what I'm saying is it may be less of a need to navigate it outside if you have a way inside to navigate it better. Sure. That's what I'm offering. And you don't have to accept it. But I had to intervene there because it's like, no, I mean, I, I went through so many years of not stepping up because I was worried about what people would think about me. And I built systems that enabled that to be less of a worry. They were external systems. And then once I kind of learned, you know what, I can, I'm making up all these people's reality of what they're going to think about me based on my own insecurity about who I am. And then whenever I started to not let that impact me as much, I could really rise up. And what I want, I know that you already have success and you're, you know, you're visible, but I want you to really be able to rise up. And when we're always using kind of an outside intervention, it, it's less likely because we're not truly comfortable inside. We have this safety mechanism. And there's nothing wrong with that mechanism. The picture of your beautiful family gives that to you. And I want you to have less reliance on the picture and more reliance on I don't know what they're really thinking about me. And then maybe I can handle whatever, whatever happens as a result. That's all, you know? Because I would not be up here and be able to do what I do before I had a way to modulate my internal stuff a little better, you know? Because there's real reasons why I wasn't doing what I needed to do. But so much of it was based on what I thought other people thought of me. And then I realized that was about me. And so then I decided to fix what was happening inside of me and rely a little less on the external stuff. And it made me more comfortable and able to function in the way I'm supposed to function in the world. But at the same time, am I like wearing a t-shirt and shorts or something? No, right? Like put on my little blazers and stuff like that. Like there are external things I do that are pragmatic and business-like. The reality is when I go home, I take all my clothes off. I just wear little shorts around everywhere. <laughs> you know, that's actually who I am more. So I really appreciate you going through that with me because <laughs> it's, it's kind of, you know, intense and you did a really good job. Yes. Thanks. Just on that thought, when we have the found there and the less concerned about the, the external or what other people may think, right? Uh, Their reality. Yeah. Um, in that instance, would it perhaps allow you to actually project? Well, because you're more comfortable with that idea, would you actually become more approachable? Do you think? Would it give that thought? Yes. That's the follow up to what we're talking about. It actually creates the approachability. Because yeah, that's because what that because your... what we're kind of putting out is I'm not really able to do this, but here, look at this, you know. And so basically, all of a sudden, you can open up. Like breathing. You can breathe more, and like basically, like I can be very open to you, because I know that I'm in charge of whether I get hurt or not. It's, it's just so different. And I know it's kind of hard because it's like almost antithetical to what all the systems we've built, especially at like our age, like where you learn how to like deal with shit in an external way to make things work, especially when it comes to making money. But yeah, it kind of, if you have these boundary things, you can be open. And then you become more approachable. Like you guys, well, you might be a little bit, but you're not really afraid of me, right? No, right? I kind of look a little scary sometimes. You're more scary at clubs. <laughs> it's true. Well, we had a whole the other day, and you asked me a question, yeah. and I was just like, holy shit, this is intense. <laughs> I know, I remember you're like, I don't know what the question is. I'm like, okay, he's, let me just back up a little bit. <laughs> and, and that's true about me. When it's all directed at someone, it's, it's not about you, though. It's about me being uncomfortable. That's that right. That's right. Because I occupy space, and I'm a bit of a force. It's true. And so, but the thing is, is that what you just said is beautiful, because that's about your reaction to it. Well, I'm still going to be me. Yeah, I was like, I want to be like that. <laughs> well, good. 
you know, and, and the things that I'm teaching you enable that where you can still be you, but not in an offensive way or like you know And I did actually titrate my energy back a little bit in that conversation. Because you get really good, if you have this stuff, of understanding how much you're putting out and where it's focused and then pulling it back or putting it out or pulling it back. See, the boundaries are pliable. So you can like learn how to like use them. It's energetic. You're learning about this in this very like, there's these boundaries, these are these words, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about an energy that you have, a buffer around yourself, you know? And I can decide how much I want to not push it out, and then other times I push it out to fill this whole freaking hotel, you know? It just depends. People are very powerful. They just don't know it. You choose everything in your life. You choose the amount of energy you have whenever you're interacting with people. They just don't know it. That's like the irony of being a human. It's the most powerful thing ever. But we don't want to own it, and we can't because of our shit because of our being treated less than nurturing, because of our lapsing into child and teen. And if you're a little bit more in an adult place, you can do whatever you need to do. Be who you're supposed to be. Yeah, good. Dave. Uh, the box, the box, the box, I'm sorry, man. Uh, his uh, thing about having some sort of like, almost like pre-apology in the talk of like, or well, not like actual, but like, sort of like, I'm a real person and I'm approachable, whatever. Um, I, I'm a pretty intense introvert as well, and uh, I've had some similar issues with people being like, oh, actually, you're not really approachable, which was surprising to me. But um, I've done the thing like that where it's like at the beginning of a talk, I'm like, I'm not going to make eye contact with you. It's going to be super weird, but like, it's not you, it's me. And then I was like, this is fucking bullshit. Like, I, I don't need to apologize for myself at all. But what, what happens, I feel like, with me, and, and I've been leaning into this, so like I'm leaning into like who I am and whatever, and that's been working out really well for me. Except that I feel like it often is ending up in the, like, well, I don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks, but it's not an adult thing. It's like kind of an adult, but also very... Your teen's involved, and yeah. so that's okay. Because the thing is, is the pendulum has, swings a little far, and you're like, oh, I'm getting some power from this. And then it starts to swing back a little bit. Now, you can manage that by working with your teen on the, hey, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. And so you can actually correct that and take him down a notch so that then you can really just not be as concerned with what people think and it'd be more balanced. But you're going to, it's OK that your teen and your adult are a little bit in an agreement right now. Is there um, the ba balance part? I'm just curious if you could be more specific as to like what that looks like. The balance part of like balancing that adult feeling of not caring too much about what other people think and the teenage feeling of like it's the same thought, but it has a little bit of different words, and it's not I don't give a fuck. So it's like the energy of like I don't give a fuck. It's like fuck off. I don't give a shit about this, right? And there's a certain power in that. But it's a team thing. It's actually kind of a weak position, because you can get thrown off that really easily. The adult version would be like, you're going to think whatever you think about me, and I'm still going to do what I need to do. Do you kind of hear the difference and feel the difference? <laughs> and so one is calm, basically. It's calm. That's the difference. OK. Yes. And then Can I have a couple of questions? You said something a while back, and I didn't catch that. Bit of time. Is it in this? Like what we just were doing right yes. now? Yes. Yeah. So you said self, sacrificing self is actively in, it decreasing self worth. Okay. I don't know if I said it that way, but that's the same thing. That I said. <laughs> you said actually that actively building low self worth. Okay, actively building low self worth. Thank you. And then the other question. Um, that's a big difference, actually. Thank you. The other question is just, I'm going back to some language and some conflict that I'm trying to resolve in what I'm hearing you say and what I'm seeing on the page. Okay. okay. So it says, boundaries continue from offending others. And I've heard you say, we can't let others be are offended. So if you're in a teen place, whenever you're speaking, yeah. you're uncontained. Yeah. And you're actively trying to push other people into the child place. So in other words, it's up to them to decide if they're offended, right? They're going to have their own idea about that. But you can know that you're not being offensive 
if you're not in a team place. If you're in a team place when you're talking to someone, you're actually trying to offend. Okay. Makes sense? And would this be the same with boundaries protect and says I avoid <laughs> Yeah. So if I have protection, then I don't automatically become a victim in my experience. I can decide what's happening and whether or not I am, maybe in this, maybe being victimized or not. So I don't but, have but to be beholden. Is a, somebody is a victim, but I, this is something that I, I've heard you say, I do this to myself. Somebody else can't do this, right? So I avoid becoming a victim. Yeah. Like, I get to decide if what happens to me, I'm a victim of it or not. In other words, am I stuck in a child place around it? Or am I able to go, OK, this thing happened, and I'm going to rise above that. That's about that person. And I don't have to be a little small piece of crap because this person did something to me that is wrong. And this is a part of like kind of what we were talking about the other day. Like I believe that we have a choice in how we're impacted by other people's reality. And that's a big concept. And I, it's not one that I, you, know, you may readily accept or even need to. But it is what I believe, that people choose if they have a boundary system. If not, you automatically become a victim. Oh, I am less than. Oh, I have no way to protect myself. Oh, I'm just defective. And so that's what I'm saying. So a choice in how we're impacted by others' reality. Yes. And then, then I don't have to automatically become a victim. I can decide what to do with even things that are true victimization, like where someone is a, trying to be an offender. I still get to decide what to do with that. But we don't know that necessarily in the moment that that's occurring. But then later in the processing of it, we can then decide whether I remain a victim even if I was victimized. And that's the difference. Your response to the victimization. Correct. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's that I get to decide what to do with it. And that can be big things, like being sexually abused, or raped, or victim of racism, things that are occurring. But I get to decide what to do with it. Do I then use that as a way to empower and move out of it, or do I not? And if I don't have a boundary system, I don't have an option. I just remain a victim, in my opinion. Does that help? Does it make sense? Good. I like that. I like that. Because you're using your boundaries. See, what you just said is a boundary thing. But notice it's kind of like pliable. You're like, I, I do understand the concept, and I'm going to work with it and see if it matches for me. That's beautiful. I have some thoughts that might into this conversation or whatever, but like, I deal with this all the time. I tend not to get offended if anybody says anything to me in any way. And then I've got my brother or my wife or whatever, like, as an example, if someone at work, like, a complete stranger, calls her a bitch, then all day she's like, oh my god, she called me a bitch or whatever. So she's like a victim all day long. And I'm like, do you know this person? It's like, no, then like, why do you fucking care, right? Or you know, because you, there's no boundary. Right, or then if you move into like someone who's close, like, you know, just a general friend, then like that, the, the degrees to how much victimization there is, right? Oh, I'm close to this person, they call me a bitch, so maybe that affects them less or more or whatever. But, like, a whole day will go like, I can't believe she said that to me. I'm like, right, because they're accepting it as truth. Right, sure. and, what, and what she doesn't notice is that she's like, I'm actually living as if this is true about me. Right, that's and that's why there has to be a boundary there. Because listen, <laughs> if you don't think people haven't called me a bitch, then you're great. I mean, like, it's like, fine. You can think whatever you want. And I don't mean it like, screw you. What I'm saying is, you think I'm a bitch. OK. So what? <laughs> like, I get to decide if I'm a bitch or not. And sometimes I am. <laughs> Just <laughs> With my teens engaged, look out. All right. So this maybe ties into what uh, Christina was, or what you were presenting, Christina. Uh, so a lot of this 
stuff that you're saying, like my mind goes to what what if this violence? Like you know, what if you say like well, I don't like you saying that or you know, I I don't buy into that and then they take it further. Well, sometimes it's not always safe to make your reality known. Like, and that's also a boundary thing. This is a great question. It's also a boundary thing, where is this safe for me to do this or not? Sometimes it's better just to walk away. Like, I was walking, I mean, I'll tell you a quick story. I guess I think it's kind of quick. But I was walking through LAX, right? And at LAX, if you're American Airlines, well, they've kind of changed a little bit. But basically, if you're a first-class passenger, there's like a separate security. Now they have like TSA pre-check and whatever. But you go through the, like this smaller security. And of course, like LA, there's like a piece of glass there. So everyone that's like standing in line like this, and you're like, ah, and you just walk through. <laughs> but that's because LA is ultimate status driven. And so basically, they make sure they <laughs> right? But they make sure that everyone can see you being better than them, basically, is the whole idea, right? And so there's like a, this little door you come out of, and all of a sudden you're like, bing, you're in the terminal. It's totally different. And so basically, I, one day I come out of that door, and I'm like walking, and I'm going to go to the little Admiral's Club thing, and all of a sudden there is this huge hand <laughs> that grabs my arm. Nobody touches me, okay? <laughs> no one touches me unless I say it's okay. And like, I'm not used to being jostled. I live in a bubble, right? And so literally, I'm walking it, and there's this huge hand, and I'm like, I literally, I'm a, like, and I'm not, well, I'm not that little, actually. But I'm not a huge guy. But I was like, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like not going to take that crap. And so I do that, and I'm like, what is going on, right? And it's like literally this six foot eight, like drunk USC football player guy. And he's like, you just bumped into my girlfriend and knocked her shit down. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, <laughs> I did not even, I mean, you talk about being thrown. Like I was immediately triggered into like a child place basically. But my teen was right there because I'm not, I may not, I was, I wanted to be like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like totally. And maybe a younger Brent would have actually which would have been dangerous. So he does that, and I'm like, listen, do you see that? And there's a security guard that stands outside that door. And I was like, you see that door right there? I was like, I just came out of there. I don't know what's going on or who you are. And the security guard is like, because they're, you know, it's LA, they're going to protect you because you paid more money. And so I'm like, <laughs> and I, he's like looking at me like, should I come over? And I was like, no, because this was getting, I was like, this is going to get bad. I was like, no, no, no. I was like, look, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it's not me, you know? And so basically, that was me exercising some good boundaries because I really did want to like punch him in the face, which it would have been like probably a mosquito on his face, like, yeah, get out of here. But if he had hit me, I would have had my jaw wired shut. His hand was as big as my head. And he was drunk as a skunk, right? And so I'm like, all right. Like, it's not me, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, it's fucking you, and like all this stuff. And I was like, oh my God. And then all of a sudden, like, I see this, like, four foot 11 little blonde cheerleader type, but she wouldn't have been a cheerleader because she's too small. But this, like, little blonde girl, she's running down the hallway, and she comes up and she just smacks the shit out of him. I swear to God, they were crazy. And like, she just jumps up and is like, and she's like, that's not the fucking guy, you goddamn idiot. <laughs> and, and I literally was like, <laughs> and just ran to the Admiral's Club, basically. But the reason I tell you that story and, is that it's also like, hey, I was able to try to use some boundaries. It was not a safe environment for you to be like, actually, I did not do that, or it's not a safe environment to punch him. So I was in, I tried, I kind of rallied and managed to be in a semi-adult place. So it's not always safe. Uh, I, I'm not myself as a freak. I have some, maybe some background with, uh, you know, violence and, and having boundaries violated. And so my mind tends to go there even if they're just smiling at me. Um, sometimes I don't always feel comfortable to be like, okay, why is he looking at me? What's going on? Right. Uh, and so there's some unresolved trauma there. Mm -hmm. 
And it can be little t trauma, if you don't like the word trauma, but there's some unresolved stuff there. And you could use this process to clean that up so that you're not as triggered by that in the world. Because whenever we are victimized in the physical world, right, then we, our child can still be stuck back there and think everything is unsafe. And you know what's interesting is then we sometimes kind of pull in unsafe things because we're resonating at that level and we start to pull it in. Yeah, well, I, you know, my initial thinking was like, okay, it's, it's nice and good to have these boundaries, but right, you know, there's five of them and they're bigger and stronger than you. But, uh, you know, what you, <laughs> yeah, what would you say to Christina was, was nice. It was like, regardless of what happens, you can get to choose your stunts of how you receive that. Exactly, and that's, and that's what the boundaries are about. So regardless of what someone thinks about you even, even if we're not talking about victimization, you get to decide what to do with it. And that's all that I want for you, is to be able to decide what to do with what happens to you, what people say to you, what they don't say to you, right? Whatever it is, you get to decide what to do. That's what I want for you. And that's why I'm teaching it to you. So it's a big difference. You know, Brian, I think one of the most uh, brilliant things I've heard um, about that, about is that is, is really this, this phrase, which is they're not responding to you. Um, they're not. Uh, and it, it's a really useful, I, I find it really useful when somebody comes at me in a way that they're, or says something to me in a way that I'm like, like I don't know what you're smoking. You know, it's more, yeah. it's more like they're, it's, they're in their own context. Everyone has their own head suffer up their ass. It's unbelievable. They're being triggered by their own triggers. And they're, right. they're not responding to you. It's some, it's, you know. It's their past. It's what happened at breakfast. It's whatever it is. It doesn't mean that we're not a catalyst for something and that we're in a relationship with people we shouldn't listen sometimes. No, no. Right. But I'm just building on what you're saying. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, listen, if their lips are moving, it's about them. If their lips are moving, it's about them. You get to decide if you agree, especially when they're telling you about you. So really, if their lips are moving, it's about them. It's not about you. Quit making everything about you. <laughs> that's the other part. Like, we all do this. We're like, oh, it must be about me. But that's literally what we're doing. We're making up other people's realities and saying that's about me. And it's not about you. That's why I said on day one, mind your own damn business. This is kind of what I'm talking about. You know? Thanks, Jay. Yep. I just want to add something to his, he was asked about introvert versus extrovert. And I wanted to, I had this. Weren't we talking about that last night, too, a little bit? Did you mention that to me? I forgot. That was you. Yeah, we were talking about introvert versus extrovert and what the definition of it being. Yeah, OK. I'm sorry, yeah. I, but yeah, you guys were, okay. Um, but the idea of like, are you being introverted and spending quality time where you're really listening to yourself or are you still like have the headphones in or playing video games? Those are also like introverted, but you're not, you're also using a wall, even though you're alone. Yeah, does that, okay. That's, how, that's very helpful, I think. Was there a question in there or no? No. Yeah, no, I think it's a, an additive comment. That's very good. Yes, and then I'm going to move on to some other stuff, OK? Because I want to get this moving. So the way that you know, this conversation started with the male version of resting bitch face, oh. and <laughs> what's really frustrating to me is I think I have the opposite, is people always want to approach me. And I feel really unsafe. Like, at the airport, I was sitting down minding my own business. When a guy comes by and he's like, hey, can, can I put my bag here for a second? Can you watch my bag? And I'd be like, ha, ha, ha. I grew up in Israel where, um, you know, it's like when I grew up, everything was like, if somebody leaves a bag, that's a fucking bomb. That's bomb like, yeah. you're about to blow up. Yeah. So I was like, no, dude, I'm not going to watch your fucking bag. I didn't say fucking bag, but I was like, I'm not going to watch your bag, bro. Um, and it took him like three times for me to say that. And then so I, I moved away because he stood there with his bag and I was like, that shit's going to blow up. I'm like, that's what I'm like feeling inside, not yeah. really thinking that. And then another woman approaches me, and she sets her bag down next to me, and she's like, can I ask you some questions? And I'm looking for like an audiobook to download on my phone. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, I took a selfie of myself, and I was like, what is going on? Because I was, was not in a good place. Like, I was anxious, and I was thinking about sure. stuff that made me sad. 
I was like, sure enough, I got a fucking smile on my face, and it's not even like, it's like my natural, you know, resting smile. Resting smile, right? <laughs> so the smile is a shame smile. That's why I call a shame smile. So you're experiencing shame in those moments, and then we kind of go like this. And it's like this tight, kind of like, as opposed to like, hey, I'm smiling, and then I'm not smiling. It's like something happens, and our shame comes up. Like smiling like this, it's just like literally. <laughs> we are not really smiling there. The other thing is, the other thing is, is that, you know, you're kind of radiating this exposure. Like, you're not, you don't have a lot of boundaries yet. And so basically, like, people can sense that. They're like, this person is very approachable. And so if you have a better boundary, I'm telling you the truth. It's unseen. Most of communication amongst humans is not with your mouth and your words. But you're kind of resonating that way. Whereas, you know, other people have a different resonance. And so if it's helpful to you, you can start trying to notice other people's resonance whenever they're in public. And so some people are very closed down and shut off, right? And those people don't get asked anything. So people are kind of like, hmm, they seem mean, right? And then other people have a bit more of a balance where they're kind of touching and containing themselves. And it's like, basically, people could approach me, but they often don't. Sometimes they do. But I kind of decide if I want to be approached, believe it or not, based on how I'm resonating at that time. So I think that has more to do with it, is that you're just kind of feeling exposed. And you do tend to walk around exposed. I've been around you for three days. I've been around you for three days. I can see it and feel it. And so that's, that's, that's this energetic thing of when you have these boundaries, you can kind of decide what they are at that time. Because sometimes I'll sit down even in a public thing and I'll be a little bit more open. Lo and behold, someone will talk to me. And then other times I'm like, nope. No one even notice, seems to notice me. So you get to kind of decide. So I think that's what's occurring. Last thing, and then I want to get back. You guys got to learn some more stuff, OK? Mm -hmm. if, if this is not, not taking the past in the direction you want to go. OK, I'll tell you. So what happens when someone is victimized and they feel overwhelmed and shame? Like, what is happening? Like, I just, I'm just stimulated by the smile mm -hmm. from the so, so what happens when they? Bag. So what happens when they feel shame? And you said that's a shame smile. So yeah. so often when someone is victimized, they experience shame for their own victimization. Correct. They take on the shame of the, the other person should be ashamed, and they take it on as their own. Yeah. And so that is why the boundaries are so important. And so then what that person can do within what I know how to do is work with their child who is ashamed whenever they don't need to be. You correct it. So there's a secondary process. In the moment, it is what it is. But then after, when they're trying to process what occurred, if they have a way to process that experience, then they go, you know what? Shame on you. This is your shame. Mm -hmm. So you have to apply what you're learning and what you're going to learn after lunch to then do that. It's a good question. Okay. You guys are doing beautifully. I don't want you to think I'm trying to shut down your questions. This is what we're here for. The material provides a platform that's really, and, and some knowledge. That's really what it's for. And then this is what we're also here to do. So you guys are doing great, but I want to move on to some more stuff, OK?